Welcome Wednesday. Um, our speaker today is Doug Pauls, a Principal Materials and Process Engineer with Rockwell Collins, an aerospace OEM in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Doug holds a BA in Chemistry and Physics and a BS in Electrical Engineering, but he has morphed into a materials engineer over his career. He's worked for the Naval Avionics Center in Indianapolis, Indiana as a materials engineer and as a technical director of Contamination Study, uh, Studies Laboratories, Kokomo, Indiana, before joining Rockwell Collins in 2000. Doug has been an active IPC chairman for over 33 years, serving as the chairman of the Cleaning and Coding Committees for over 10. He's, his most recent accomplishment has been um, being awarded the IPC's top honor, the IPC Hall of Fame Award. I present to you Doug Pauls. All right. Thank you very much, Gina. And welcome, everyone, to uh, Wisdom Wednesday. Um, uh, today I'm going to be speaking to you as the, the former chairman, I handed this off uh, last year, uh, of the IPC's cleaning and coding committees. And I have been, uh, throughout my career, focused on many of the aspects of cleaning and coding and cleanliness assessment. And so what I'm going to be talking about uh, this morning, and unfortunately we only have a half an hour, is a proposed Section 8 cleanliness requirements for J-Standard 1, and I will emphasize the word uh, proposed that uh, what we have here has not yet been ratified by the committee, uh, but most have indicated to me that this change is, is long overdue uh, and are generally supportive of the approach. Um, so I, I kind of have to tell a little bit of, of a story behind this. Um, those of us who are in the cleanliness assessment world have have long griped about uh, the use of resistivity of solvent extract or rose testing for cleanliness assessment. And in the J Standard 1 committees a couple of years ago, Dan Foster, the head of the J Standard 1 committee, I think got tired of my griping about it and uh, kind of looked at me and said, um, well, if this is broke, we need to fix it. Say, uh, Doug, don't we have a cleaning and coating committee? Why, yes, we do. Uh, wouldn't they be the ones to fix this one? Uh, yes, they would. And as the chairman, wouldn't you be the one to lead this? Ah, uh, crap. Yes. So um, the lesson to be learned from that is that don't gripe about a system unless you're willing to lead the charge to fix it. So what grew out of that was uh, the development of a group of subject matter experts, and you see them listed here, um, to go off and address this issue. If we can't really use ROSE for cleanliness assessment anymore, what should we use? And so I was the chair of this group, and um, I call it the Rhino team simply because Tiger team is overused in my opinion. And I have much more of a resemblance to a rhinoceros than I do a tiger. But you'll notice the people here are a good mixture of uh, flux and cleaning suppliers, uh, level or class two and class three contract manufacturers, a number of OEMs for this, as well as uh, some of the labs who do cleanliness assessment uh, for a living. And all of these people have decades of process experience and I will say it's been a, a real pleasure to work with with uh, each of them. So the task that was put before this particular group was that in J Standard 1 all of the revisions up through RevF which is current were based on ROSE testing, resistivity of solvent extract. And that test itself was developed in the 1970s with an established limit of 1.56 micrograms of sodium chloride equivalents uh, per square centimeter. And for a number of reasons, many of which I won't get into today, that practice of determining whether or not something is clean or not clean based solely on ROSE data should be considered an obsolete practice. So we started this back in September of 2015 um, and this this working group said, all right, what, do, what does the next generation of ionic testing look like? 
and we held uh, teleconferences basically uh, every couple of weeks over the last two years. A lot of work has been put into this. We had two objectives from this. First of all, to provide a, a rewrite of Section 8, which is the cleanliness part of J Standard 1, for committee review for revision G. And the present proposal, which was finished, which was provided in uh, early June of this year, is on IPC's collaboration site, their COBI site, site for the J Standard 1. So if you are part of the J Standard 1 committee uh, and can access COBI, uh, that is already there for your review. But because the, the whole idea of cleaning and cleanliness assessment is one in which there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of wrong information, a lot of misconceptions out there, that this group of subject matter experts would generate an associated white paper to explain a lot of this to the masses, people who don't have these decades of experience. And in this, so whatever we came up with, you need to address both clean and no clean processes, you need to talk about how do you validate a process. If we can't use rows for determining acceptably clean or unacceptably dirty, how do you determine that? And how do you do process monitoring? And so that's what we did with all of it. In short, what does the next generation of ionic residue testing look like? And so the progress that we've been making so far is that we have provided um, the J Standard 1 Section 8. We, we did the first presentation in the fall of 2016, about a year ago. And we had put this before the committee and we got back what I consider to be a very small number of comments uh, against that proposal, but we dispositioned those per IPC rules. Um, we also held a general session of this then this year at IPC APEX. Uh, most people, we have said, are, are very much in favor of this, but it's a big change. And people have to think, well, how is my company going to address this different type of change? Um, and so we finished that effort. Uh, the, the work of our, of our Rhino team, I think, is, is finished for the most part because we turned in the proposal in June as well as the draft paper. Now that white paper, uh, which explains a lot of this proposal, gives good examples to this, is going to be published as IPC's White Paper 19 uh, with that title. And uh, Teresa Rao of IPC has indicated it's in typesetting right now and should be available sometime in the next couple of weeks. But the draft, the non-typeset draft, should be available to anyone who wants to review it. Um, and you can get that either from the IPC Kavi site if you can access that, or from IPC, probably through Teresa Rao, or from me directly. So the new section eight. In looking at this, we did want to keep what I call, if it ain't broke, don't fix it option. Um, and, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But the whole key behind this is determining a qualified manufacturing process. Uh, because every type of assembly is going to have its own level of cleanliness requirements, some are more sensitive than others, um, you really have to take a look at the manufacturing process and how well you control the process and what do you get from that control process. Well. So this all comes down to the concept of the qualified manufacturing process. What you see there is taken directly from our proposal. The key concepts from this is that, as I indicated before, that rose testing for product acceptance, you know, is it acceptably clean, is it rejectably dirty, should be an obsolete practice for determining cleanliness acceptability. Uh, rose testing for process controls, perfectly acceptable, but the numbers have to mean something, and they should be scientifically or statistically determined. I was in a conversation with uh, uh, with a uh, one indiv individual who had called me up, and their rows requirements in their process was 0 0.753 
rather than the 1.56. I said, that's interesting. That's pretty specific. Where'd that come from? We wanted to be twice as good as the J standard one spec. But there was absolutely no science behind that. Uh, you do need to come to the understanding that there's no one set value that determines a line between acceptably clean and unacceptably dirty. Modern assemblies are simply uh, too complex for that to happen. And there's no one way of determining acceptably clean and unacceptably dirty. Some people in previous versions of J standard one said, well, I have to do, if I do this type of uh, testing uh, this one time through, um, then that says that everything is fine. No. The future of this is you're going to have to be have to do your homework. You're going to have to look into this in greater depth and understand your materials and processes better than you do now. And we realize that that is a, a major thing to do. All right. So I said before that we wanted the if it ain't broke, don't fix it option. So in our proposal, as an example, if I'm a company who's been manufacturing with my set with a set product it's mature I haven't changed my materials I haven't changed my process uh, everything's going along fine uh, my customers are happy with the process uh, there's been no uh, any kind of electrochemical type of failure mechanisms leakage corrosion metal migration uh, everything is hunky-dory uh, do I have to now do you know, a lot of this extra testing. Yeah. No, no, you don't. So you can point to this historical uh, acceptability as your objective evidence, and you don't have to do the additional testing. Uh, if, however, uh, rose testing is the only data that you have with nothing else to support it, yeah, then rose itself is not acceptable as your only objective evidence. And uh, the committee also felt that any time you do quali uh, qualifying a manufacturing process, you really need to incorporate bias and humidity and temperature into this. Simple in-circuit testing won't show you a cleanliness problem. Simple thermal cycling, if there's no power applied, if there's no chance for humidity or condensation won't tell you if you have a cleanliness related problem. So some form of temperature humidity bias testing is how a qualified manufacturing process should be de uh, determined. Um, I, I use surface insulation resistance testing or SIR for almost everything that I do. Now I know a lot of people have qualified their manufacturing process using chemical analysis alone, for example, using ion chromatography. And I will tell you, I am a big fan of ion chromatography. I do it every week. But it does not tell you what the effects of those residues are under humid conditions. It tells you what chemicals are present, but not their effects. And that's why you need SIR as your basis or something similar. We also wanted to address what do we how much can we change the manufacturing process before having to do requalification? And so we divided this up into a level one and a level two. Um, most of your quality uh, system, ISO 9000 or for aerospace AS9100, are very good about differentiating what is a major and minor change to a product but they do not address what's a major and minor change for a process. And so we attempted to do that here. And if you take a look at residues and what can be on the circuit board that, that changes your reliability of performance, changing a flux or flux bearing materials, if you change your cleaning agent, if you change your suppliers, the solder mask itself can have um, a big impact on how much it retains uh, or or holds on to residues. And if you're doing a, a geographic change in manufacturing locations, 
if my qualified process is here in Cedar Rapids and I open up a new facility in Romania where sources of supply are different, where the culture is different, language is different, training is different, then I need to do a major effort to make sure that that process matches the base process. Then there are level two things. We all make uh, changes in our manufacturing parameters uh, to adjust uh, different requirements in our manufacturing process flows. But if I'm going to, say, change my inline aqueous cleaner from two feet to mi per minute to four feet per minute, um, I should have some objective evidence behind it that says I'm giving, getting the same level of cleaning between, uh, between those two. Now that might be um, uh, uh, rose data, though I would not recommend it. It might be something like ion chromatography, uh, but it's a lesser, uh, lesser effort required for objective evidence than, than requalification. Changes in reflow profiles, because that can affect the reactivity of your flux residues, and changes within a manufacturing location and here, if I'm moving one of my manufacturing lines from one of our facilities in Cedar Rapids to a different one uh, here in Cedar Rapids, uh, it's the same sources of supply, same material, same training. I would just have to do something minor to make sure that the new line is giving me what the old line did. We also wanted to take a look at process monitoring, and this is what ROSE testing was intended for. And so the process qualification testing is what you would use to determine um, how often should you sample a line to be, in, uh, be considered in control, and that should be statistically based. And we also centered then around a control limit. What is your action point? And we call that the upper control limit. And uh, if I go through my qualification work and I say, for example, uh, when I got a good qualification result, uh, I did testing on product and it was consistently uh, 0.4 plus or minus uh, 1 or uh, 0.1, well, then maybe my upper control limit might be that mean plus three standard deviations. Let's call it 0.5. And so if something happens above 0.5, then an investigation as to why that happened is spurred. That upper control limit is not defined as the line between acceptable or unacceptable. We did not feel it appropriate to require a manufacturer to go determine at what point is their product un unacceptably unclean, although it might be prudent to do so. So we do talk about process monitoring and we do talk in the proposal about how you would do that if your product is clean and how you would do that if your product is no clean. All right. Um, the issue of white residues um, ha has been around for, well, as long as I've been in the industry. And we talked in here about residues which... Um, uh, normally, you would like your boards to be free of residues, but if you look close enough, in almost or even in the best uh, manufacturing process, you may have some very faint white residues. Um, and we said if the residues don't violate minimum electrical clearance, it's not a defect. And even if they do violate minimum electrical clearance, it's not a defect if you have objective evidence that the residue is not a reliability risk. I've done a lot of testing of white residues, and I've got a lot of objective evidence behind this that says, yeah, you can see a faint haze on our products, but um, I have my data that says there's no way that this is a problem. And in 99 out of 100 times, that's acceptable. But of course, Everything can be overridden by the A bus as it as agreed between user and supplier. If the customer says, "I don't want to see a residue anywhere on this board." Well, that's that's something that is worked out here, but um, the the standard itself is not going to require you to have um, an assembly with no uh, with no visible residues. 
All right, so uh, kind of where do we go from this point? This is all at a very high level, um, and I will stress again that the material, this Section 8, is only proposed. It has not been approved yet. Uh, it has been available for J Standard 1 committee review since uh, early June. Uh, I do understand that today's presentation is being recorded and will shortly be up on the IPC uh, web page for members only. Uh, and, and so this type of presentation can be shown to other people. It's going to lead to a lot of questions. Uh, there's going to be some time in our IPC fall meeting at Rosemont, and uh, Dr. Udo Welzel of uh, uh, Bosch in Germany and Joe Kane of Raytheon are going to uh, lead that discussion. I would be there, but at that time I'm going to be walking my daughter Laura down the aisle at her wedding, and somehow that takes precedence over a J Standard 1 meeting, oddly enough. And so the committee there will then determine this can have a major impact on virtually every electronics assembler. How do we handle this? Do we handle it as an amendment to the upcoming um, Rev-G, which is currently in ballot? Uh, is, it, is it something that is deferred to Rev-H? Uh, so they will be deciding that uh, coming up here. In the meantime, of course, everyone, I would imagine, is going to have a lot of questions to this. And uh, uh, I will indica I'll indicate, I'll put in a shameless plug for myself, is that I've uh, had, I've proposed and have uh, been accepted a half-day professional development course on this material. It kind of goes back to a, a comment that came from a good friend of mine, uh, Joe, uh, Joe, who had said, uh, you know, Doug, we don't have anyone in our facility who does what you do. I have no idea where I would start to do things uh, that I would get a qualified manufacturing process. And so that's what this course um, will be. In the meantime, the white paper, uh, that white paper 19, it has a lot of good text in there uh, that explains what we're talking about. And so uh, uh, earlier on, on the first slide of this, I had my, uh, my email address. Uh, I, would, I would be happy to answer any questions, but I would first ask that you read through that white paper because that should answer many of them. Um, thereafter, uh, if you still have questions, they can be uh, put forward to Teresa Rao or to myself. Uh, Teresa is the the IPC staff liaison for the J Standard One group, and she's very proficient at herding chickens. So if you uh, if you send comments after reviewing the proposal and after reviewing the white paper, then uh, please send those to uh, Teresa and myself, and we'll do the best that we can to answer them. Um, to get a copy of that paper, um, it can either be, I can either, you can send the, or email the request to me or to um, uh, Teresa Rao, and if the typeset version is not available, certainly you can see the draft. And with that, that's to the end of the presentation, um, and so Gina, I will hand that back over to you. I don't know if we want to address any questions here in our few remaining minutes? Um, well, thank you, Mr. Pauls. Um, we truly appreciate your instruction and congratulations on your daughter's upcoming nuptials. Thank you. Um, you're very welcome. This recording will be available to, in the members only section of IPC's website probably later today or tomorrow. Please join us next month um, for our Wisdom Wednesday selection, September 13th, same time, 10 o'clock to 10.30. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining us, as always.